Hi, my name is Steve Swain, and I'm the director of the Montgomery Fellows Program. It's been our privilege to have Phil Cly with us this summer, 2020, as our Montgomery Fellow in Residence. And he's been engaging in a number of conversations with interesting people. Now imagine, if you will, a conversation between one Dartmouth alum who goes on to serve in the Marines, writes a book that ends up on the New York Times bestselling list, and that person having a conversation with a Dartmouth alum who goes into the Marines and writes a book that ends up on the New York Times bestselling list. Uh, Phil's conversation partner is Nate Fick. Nate graduated from Dartmouth in 1999, went on as a second lieutenant to serve in the Marines until December of 2003, went on to get an MPA from the Kennedy School and an MBA from the Business School, both at Harvard, and he currently serves as the general manager of Elastic Security. Nate also was a Dartmouth trustee and has written a lot of nonfiction, just as Phil Cly has. They are Marines, they are Dartmouth alums, they are fathers, they are thoughtful individuals, and some of the last parts of the conversation really get at the heart of who they are as human beings. I trust you'll enjoy this conversation, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, thanks to the Montgomery Fellows Program for setting this up. I'm very excited, uh, honestly, to be doing this with uh, with you, Nate. Um, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, you know, you have well, this book, uh, One Bullet Away, which when I was going into the basic school in 2005, this was the book that everybody uh, was reading as they were trying to figure out what it was, uh, what it was going to be like to be a Marine officer. Uh, what they should be prepared for. And it was also um, uh, uh, especially meaningful to me that it was uh, a book written by another uh, Dartmouth man who had gone into the Marine Corps. So um, uh, just uh, thrilled, to, uh, <laughs> th thrilled to be in contact. And I suppose I wanted to ask you about a little bit about that path. You talk about it in the book of going from being a classics major uh, at Dartmouth to a Marine officer. Uh, thanks, Phil. And it, listen, it's a real thrill to be, be here with you as well. Um, I've, been, I've been a fan of yours and a follower since, uh, since redeployment was published. Uh, and, and Steve, thank you. Um, Mon the Montgomery Fellowship has always been one of my favorite things at Dartmouth. I just think it's a wonderful program. And, uh, and now it's a real honor to, uh, to, to play a small part here in, in Phil's fellowship. Um, well, it's, uh, it, is, it is striking, Phil, that we followed very similar paths. Um, and, and one big difference in my view is, is uh, you know, I graduated from Dartmouth a couple of years before 9-11 um, and so joined a, a peacetime military. Um, and in, in that sense, didn't really know what I was getting into. You know, it was, it was the 90s and um, people weren't talking much about, uh, the, the war, wars weren't part of the popular consciousness, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, I was interested in, in public service. Um, my father had served in the military and, and always talked about it as a, as a positive transformative experience in his life. Uh, I liked team sports. I liked the outdoors. Uh, I didn't want to be a consultant or an investment banker. You know, in, in, a, in a way, it was like um, I, I wasn't really sure what else to do. So I thought, uh, well, why not go do something, you know, hard and interesting um, and, and I mean, that, that was it. It, it. it wasn't some, you know, great, like, nationalistic impulse on my part. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the desire to not be a consultant or an investment banker is one that I've heard before from some people as, as a reason for going into the Marine Corps. Um, uh, and you, you, studied, you studied the classics. It seems to me, you know, I was a, a creative writing uh, uh, major. Um, uh, which, you know, uh, worked very well for me uh, ultimately becoming a public <laughs> affairs officer, uh, though it uh, uh, raised some eyebrows as maybe the, the best, um, uh, best, best thing to study before you went into the Marine Corps. Uh, you were a classics major, which to me seems actually perfect. Uh, was, that, uh, was that a resource for you? Yeah, you know, I mean, it really was. The, the, there's the, there was this sense in the, in, the, in the ancient world of citizenship um, you know, particularly in, in, in Greece and in Rome. And this idea that to be a fully participating citizen in a democracy, um, you had to contribute back in some way. 
And look, those definitions have changed a lot in the last couple of millennia, right? We take a much more inclusive view now. And, and I think that's obviously um, uh, progress. Uh, but, but the whole notion of, you know, of, of having some skin in the game, of being part of uh, the broader uh, whole, it just, it resonated with me and it still resonates with me. And, you know, you and I right now are having this conversation um, uh, remotely and your fellowship is virtual because, because yeah. we're in the midst of this pandemic, right? And I think it's really highlighting, you know, at least in my view, that, that uh, we've, we've lost some sense or of, of, uh, of a whole, of, of commonality, of shared experience, of, of shared purpose. Um, you know, I found that in the Marines and uh, lots, lots of issues about foreign policy that we can talk about. And, you know, but, but I think the, the simple fact of being part of something bigger than yourself is, uh, is meaningful for young people. And, you know, I certainly find now 20, or, you know, 20 plus years later that, uh, that I seem to have more in common with my Dartmouth classmates who were, you know, Peace Corps volunteers. Yes. Uh, than I do with uh, with the ones who followed, you know, more more conventional paths. I mean, I, I wonder how you see that. No, absolutely. I think it's it's the it's the drive to service. And you know, I think <clears throat> as military service has become sort of more rare, and I think people have less contact with it. It's become um, you know, sort of people see it as as existing in this far away sphere of a particular type of service that's somehow distinct and different. And I don't actually feel that way. Um, you know, I, I, I always think of Washington in his uh, sort of address to his, his troops at the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, uh, you know, urging them to display all the same virtues in civic life that they had on the field and that they, it was their responsibility to uh, add their best endeavors to those of their worthy fellow citizens. And I think that that sort of impetus for citizenship uh, for sort of robust citizenship and service um is was to me one of the most sort of appealing things about what you had in in you know a group of young young kids who'd raise their hand to you know serve their country and it's something that is not just exclusive to the military um and it's funny because you know a lot of veterans i feel like it's been you know, have felt that their service to country wasn't really complete until they did something stateside. I have a, a friend who felt like his service wasn't complete until he'd worked for the Parks Department. Um, you know, I think of guys like like Jake Wood starting Team Rubicon, right? Mm -hmm. um, where you have veterans using using their skills to help coordinate um, uh, relief in, in, in the wake of natural disasters and, and things like that. And I think that that... Uh, that sense of service and collective purpose is tremendously important. And it, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the things that, uh, that um, I cherish from, from the time in, in, in the military. Um, and <laughs> it's also, I think, for a lot of my generation of writers who have served, uh, part of the drive to to write about these wars and to write about conflict you know it, you were talking about the the ancient greek notion of of citizenship and participation and i always think of the way that you know you would have these plays that would be put on sometimes plays um that were written by veterans themselves you know sophocles was a a a, a greek general um and they were not sort of uh you know, propagandistic, patriotic, gruel, right? Uh, these were robust, difficult, painful plays. I, I remember Brian Doeries, who is, uh, runs a program called Theater of War, where they, they put on a Greek theater for active duty audiences, um, uh, did a, a showing of Ajax, right, with a bunch of Marines in the audience. And they had a Q&A afterwards, and he, and he, um, and he mentioned that the, the author of the play was a... Uh, veteran and, and a former Greek general. And he said, you know, why do you think a Greek general would have uh, written a play like this? And a Marine, uh, I think Corporal or Lance Corporal in the front says, uh, to raise morale. And he laughs and he, and he thinks to himself, like, well, you know, how would it raise morale to have a play where, uh, you know, one of the greatest Greek soldiers is betrayed by his commanders, goes insane, humiliates himself and then commits suicide? How would that raise morale? Why would that raise morale? And the, uh, the Marine replies, because it's true. 
And, um, and I think about that and I think about like, you know, the hunger that us young lieutenants had to read your book uh, as this, you know, means of accessing this uh, experience that we're going to collectively enter into uh, that we could then sort of talk about, get purchase on in a better way. It's, it's funny. I, I had a conversation, you know, many years after. And the, and the reason, the, the impetus for me to write the book, and that was back in 2005, so it was pretty, pretty soon after the experience, was just that uh, we heard from journalists and generals and politicians, but we hadn't at that point really heard from, right. from many people who, who, you know, had actually been fighting these wars. And just by virtue of timing and circumstance, I happened to be kind of in the initial salvo in, in both, in Afghanistan in 01 and Iraq in 03. Um, and I had this, this powerful urge to write down some of the experience. And I, I, I hadn't thought about publishing it. I thought I would stick it in my desk drawer and show it to my kids someday. Um, but uh, one thing led to another and, and it found the light of day. And years after it was published, I had a conversation with Michael Lewis, um, who, who, you know, just describing um, the, the experience of, of writing a book that people then read and like the shock every time someone actually reads it, right? In, in a way. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, and he, he laughed and he said, yeah, I wrote Liar's Poker as a cautionary tale, which was his, his big, big book about, about kind of go, go Wall Street, you know, Solomon Brothers in the 80s. He said, I wrote it as a cautionary tale and people read it as a how to manual. And so, you know, I always feel this like twinge of like anxious responsibility when somebody says, yeah, I read it and it yours and it influenced my decision to join the Marines or, you know, illuminated something about the, you know, whatever. Um, so it, it, it always makes me nervous when people say that. But I hear you. I mean, I, I, uh, there's this chasm, I think, in our society um, mm -hmm. between, uh, between the military and, and you know, the rest of the society that it, it ostensibly needs to draw from and represent and protect. Um, and we need people who can bridge that chasm. And you know, just, just recently, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed reading uh, Chris Chivers in the, in the New York Times, yeah. another Fantastic. Marine, yeah, infantry officer in the Marines who took a Marine unit into LA um, during, the, during the, the, the unrest in Los Angeles in the 90s. And just the fact that he did that and that he had the experience of being on the other end of that rifle um, mm -hmm. uh, has, has, I think, helped him write some of the most nuanced and perceptive pieces about uh, unrest and, and responses to unrest in, in America today. And absolutely. I just, yeah. I just I, really appreciate that kind of, uh, the complexity of experience that, that some people can bring to bear. There have been a lot of interesting pieces, um, from former veterans about policing in America. Actually, I think of, uh, Alex yeah. Horton, uh, at yeah. the, um, Washington post did a very interesting piece called, uh, uh, it was something like, uh, I used to raid insurgents in Iraq, then the police raided me in my home yeah. in Fairfield, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was about a sort of very aggressive <laughs> raid that the police yeah. did on him, um, and why that might not have been the best tactic to use. Um, it's, 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 you know, one of the things that is kind of fascinating and deeply frustrating to me is that the past two decades of war have actually taught us a lot about the limits of the use of raw force, um, about the complexity of trying to achieve a sort of stable political order, um, and the, the need for non-kinetic tools when you're dealing with, you know, complex human populations um, with legitimate grievances. Uh, and it seems as though uh, those lessons sort of exist in discussions among military folk, they exist in discussions among academics, but I don't feel like they uh, have necessarily penetrated into the culture. And I think it is really important for people like, uh, like Shivers or Horton or, 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 or other vets who have experience in those matters to speak up. And I think it, it, uh, it helps create a bridge um, because, you know, <laughs> once you think about it from, uh, you know, from that perspective, and I, I forget the name of the Shivers piece in the Times about his time in, uh, in LA. Um, all of a sudden, you say, oh, "Okay, this, some of what we're doing yeah. seems totally insane." Yeah. So, I mean, the, the experience has a long tail, right? In in a lot of ways, it sticks right. with you. It's searing, mm -hmm. and um, actually, something that really brought that point home for me recently was the uh, the cover image of the French edition of uh, of redeployment oh, of, of yeah. your book. Um, 
which, you know, I'm, I'm going to run the risk here of trying to describe a picture in words, uh, but uh, um, the, the image is, is you know, a shot from the rear of a, of a man and a woman with their arms around one another and two kids looking over a, a white picket fence at a beautiful house, mm -hmm. kind of the classic, you know, American dream kind of scene. Uh, but the shadow that he's casting on the ground is is in is in full combat gear, like helmet yeah. and flak jacket, and and uh, it reminded me of there. There's an old there's an old image from the from the wall, um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial of a of a guy in a suit and a briefcase at the wall, touching you know touching yeah. the names on the wall and looking back in the reflection are his old comrades, you know, in in in, in combat gear. Um, and and it's a real it's a stunning cover, Phil. I mean, it's really spectacular. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did a great job with it. And and uh, is is that how how do you think about that long tail? You know, and and how does it stay with you? It, it, it's it's one of these strange things because I, I I would not give up that experience for anything. I will always it will I'll, it will always have been a great honor to have been an officer in the Marine Corps, right? Um, and I still keep in contact with, uh, you know, some of my guys, um, it's sort of funny to see where, where they've ended up. Some guys have stayed in, you know, some guys are, you know, all different, different corners of America. Um, the <clears throat> very peculiar thing about getting out of the military during these wars is, you know, I joined and we'd already been at war for a couple of years. And I got out in 2009 and we are still there, right? Um, I visited, you know, I visited Iraq in December, right? And I saw, mm -hmm. uh, you know, went through Mosul and uh, drove through Talfar and Sinjar, um, you know, where there'd been genocide. Um, and, you know, it's very horrific to, to, to think about the sort of long tail consequences that continue to unfold, right? It's, 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 it's not as though I left the war and the war stopped. Um, and then also, you know, one of the things that was uh, difficult to wrap my head around, uh, and I know you had the same experiences, you leave, but other people are going who you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't out of the Marine Corps very long when I found out that a Marine that I knew and liked very much had been killed in Afghanistan. Uh, later, a uh, guy who had been sort of my right-hand man in, in Lejeune got blown up, um, and he ended up uh, losing one eye, uh, doing great, uh, still in the Corps. Um, you know, another guy got uh, got shot. Um, who had served within Iraq and, uh, and, you know, meanwhile, I'm like living in New York, like having a great yeah. life. Yeah. Uh, you know, I found out that I was like writing in a, uh, a coffee shop slash bar in Brooklyn. And, uh, uh, there was literally like a band was about to set up with a ukulele. Like it could not have been more, um, uh, you know, like straight out of girls or whatever. Uh, and that's when I got the phone call to learn that, that a guy knew, uh, some Marine uh, who knew us both called me and let me know that a, a, a Marine uh, that we'd served with got shot. Um, and it's just very, yeah. it just, it's hard to get your head around, right? So, so there's that, um, just sort of, uh, Pick, you know, sort of strange and, and, and often painful emotional way. But there's also, I think, the fact that um, uh, having been in the Marine Corps gave me a lot of strengths, right? And, and um, was something that taught me a lot and exposed me to a much wider range of, uh, of people and, uh, and insisted on the value of a lot of the, the, the things that I, you know, that I'd seen people display courage on our integrity uh, you know it, it um you know when you're when you see people in that sort of environment either displaying virtues or their absence uh, the importance of those things becomes very stark and so um i it's I'm probably like anything a, a double-edged sword but i think that 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 shadow um uh that stays behind you 
it can be difficult, but it also can be a source of strength. Our, uh, our mutual friend, uh, Elliot Ackerman, yeah. wrote something recently that, that really um, uh, struck me. He, he said, you know, to your point, that, that uh, I mean, I've been, I've been gone for almost 20 years now. You've been gone for 10, right? And, yeah. and, and the wars still go on. Um, and people still deploy and people still get hurt and people still get killed. Um, he said that, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a conflict where there's no armistice, a conflict where there's no VE day, um, yeah. each man and woman who, who participates in the conflict uh, has to make his or her own separate piece. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, um, I, I actually think the, the, the writing for me was like part of the making a making peace. Um, and I, uh, I dedicated, I dedicated my book to my successor. Uh, I was in a unit where we picked our successors and uh, you know, the, the, the guy who took over from me, uh, Brent Morrell was killed in a firefight in Fallujah in 2004. Um, you know, I mean, literally doing my job. And, um, and I noticed that, that, um, that the, the, you dedicated redeployment uh, to your parents and, and yeah. say that, uh, that they had three sons who, who joined the military in the time of war. So, um, I mean, we've, we've never talked about this. Like, what are your brothers doing? <laughs> uh, they're doing very well. One's still in the res army reserves, uh, army, you know, I mean, That's sometimes right. it happens. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what was going on with that. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, my older brother, I actually married a Marine. Uh, he, but you know, they're both out. Um, so he still works in, um, he still works for the DOD actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, so still, still involved in, in, in these things. Uh, but yeah, they're doing, you know, they're doing very well. Um, uh, yeah, it's, and it's funny because, you know, my family is not a military family, right? Uh -huh. Um, uh, my dad, uh, was a banker. He spent time in the Peace Corps. My mother worked in international medical aid, um, so sort of eye towards foreign policy and my grand maternal grandfather had been a career foreign service officer, um, who <laughs> this is sort of a tidbit of trivia, but he accepted the Nobel peace prize on behalf of Henry Kissinger. Uh, yeah. So, uh, talk about sort of strange, um, ends of war. Uh, Kissinger didn't want to show up because uh, they knew he was going to get protested. So, uh, my grandfather, uh, accepted the prize on behalf of the Scandinavian uh, students through snowballs at his car, uh, which strikes me as a very sort of delightfully Scandinavian um, method of protest. Um, so a notion of public service and, and also an interest in foreign policy was was always present in my family. So it's not that surprising that in in a time of war, three of us, three of the five boys would, would sign up. Also five boys, so it was kind of like constant warfare growing up anyway. It sort of yeah. makes sense, yeah. 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 It's funny. Um, it's, uh, I think that, you know, w w one of the common traits that I, that I observe in, in people who've shared th this experience is a, is a really dark sense of humor. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 just to put a fine point on it, like I, you know, I, I, um, every now and then there's a book that I'll share with my wife and say, Hey, if you want to, you know, you want to learn more about what it was like, read this. And, and, and yours is one of them. And, uh, thank you. You know, I, I, so I'm, I'm like laughing out loud. Uh, reading <laughs> one of them. I mean, just like rolling on the floor, tears in my eyes, laughing. And then, and then she reads it and it's like stomach churning, right? She feels sick. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of messed up, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've had that experience at readings where sometimes, um, uh, I'll read a bit from the book, uh, Particularly, there's a story called Bodies, which is about a mortuary affairs guy. And I've had experiences where like there's, there's like a bunch of vets and a bunch of non-vets. Um, and there will be bits where the vets will start cracking up. And then you'll see like discomfort on the faces of other people. Um, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> but it's like a, it's a portal to a, to a real kind of, I don't know, a philosophy. I mean, one, one of the... One of the one of the scenes that that that's um, that really stuck with me was uh, was a, a bunch of our artillery guys uh, have fired their first real artillery mission. And with artillery, right, right like the, 
the, these huge explosive rounds, they go miles away. You don't see, you generally tend not to see what they hit. And, uh, and so then they go to lunch or go to eat a meal and they're talking about, well, do you think we killed anybody? And well, how many people could one of these rounds kill? And they say, sort of do the math and divide it up. And they're like, well, <laughs> how many of us are there? And well, each of us killed like, you know, seven eighths of a person or something or whatever. Right, and, right. And, uh, and then uh, they start talking about, you know, well, what would we get charged with if we had done this in the United States? <laughs> and and <laughs> this, this sort of goes on and on. And, and, and there's a debate between the, the, the guy who pulled the lanyard and the guy who loads yeah. the rounds. And you know, he says, well, I didn't kill anybody. I was just loading the rounds. If I loaded an M16 and handed it to somebody else and he shot somebody, I wouldn't get charged with murder. And which actually is like, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's uh, some real insight there that, that um, is it just, it, I, I remember seeing that kind of thing all the time. And um, you know, what, one, one of the moments that just that I'll share quickly. Uh, it was it was after we got in a fight, and and one of my Marines, uh, ha- his team leader had been shot, and and we medevaced him. And I find the next morning, you know, as the sun comes up, I see this Marine sitting there holding an AK-47 bullet in his hand, uh, and it's the bullet that had passed through his team leader and then rattled mm-hmm. around inside a vehicle and came to a stop. And uh, and I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, he looks at me and he says, the difference between life and death out here is seconds and millimeters. It's the sacred geometry of chance. You know, and this guy, this is a, you know, this guy by his own description grew up in a bunch of uh, foster homes uh, and and some public facilities in Texas that he described as gladiator academies. He'd gone to high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, and he's sitting there talking about the sacred geometry of chance. And, and um, you know, there's, there's a real like, there's a reality to, to, to this experience that, that, um, that's something I'm always grateful for. Yeah. There's, there's no veneer. <laughs> a, a, a and reality, you expose yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And then also the weird unreality of not knowing like, yeah. you know, who's responsible and, and, uh, uh, which maybe is where the humor comes in. Right. I mean, I think, uh, like, the thing about like war literature is that it's some of the funniest literature ever written, right? I mean, Catch-22 is hysterical. Um, you know, goodbye to all that, right? Uh, Robert Graves, I always think of the, the line where, um, uh, you know, the, the officer is briefing the mission, is explaining, and then, you know, we're gonna do this, artillery is gonna come in, and then, then we're gonna go, and this is the nature of the attack, and this is the purpose of it, and then he stops and he looks at everybody and he goes, course we're all gonna die and then the next line is we all laughed right right (laughs) Right. and um uh yeah it's uh uh humor has always been one of the soldiers uh weapons for dealing with the sheer absurdity of 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 war um especially in the modern era right so you know you, you you wrote the book and then a lot of your public commentary though has been, has been you know, nonfiction. It's been, you've been talking about real events um, and, and, yes. and offering perspectives on them in real time. Um, so you, you have experience on the, on the fiction and nonfiction side of, uh, of trying to interpret these experiences. Um, can, can you just talk a little bit about that? I mean, uh, how, how do you, which is more true? I mean, that's sort of the under, the, the, the question beneath it all, I think for, for, for many of us. All right, which, which is more true? Oh, the fiction. The fiction is the truest. Um, it's the hardest. Uh, not that the nonfiction is not hard. Um, you know, the, the fiction is where you, you take whatever you, you think about the world and, and, and whatever you want to believe about the world and you try and put it into situations and characters and, uh, and put those situations, those characters under pressure and see what shakes out. And, and what happens as you do that is you start to realize that your ideas about the world were actually pretty thin. Um, that when you're trying to create a character in a situation that feels real, um, it, it inevitably just demolishes whatever you thought you knew about the world. Um, because, you know, sort of most of the time you can walk around with, with, caricatures in your head convinced that that's reality right um 
And I think, you know, you can sort of see that from a lot of contemporary political debate, which, which relies very heavily on, on, on caricature or at the very least very thin understandings of, of, of other people and situations. Um, but then you try and write that in fiction and the thinness comes screaming through. And so you have to make those, those characters more real, um, which then changes the way they interact in the world. Um, so I, I would say fiction is definitely the hardest. It's, it's, it's the most rigorous, I think. Um, but nonfiction is, is, is doing a, a somewhat different task. Uh, and you, you're trying to really rigorously follow an argument and, and, um, and a lot of times, uh, <laughs> a lot of times sort of the, 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 the beginning of like a nonfiction piece will, will, will start with me just getting really, really angry about something. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then just having to sort of write that out, um, and, and try and subject it to a lot of the same pressure and also a lot of the same kind of self doubt, right? Because I think that there's a, uh, there's always a temptation to pontificate on a topic that you, you, you think you know a lot about, but, uh, the only way that a work becomes good and persuasive is if you, if you subject it to to a certain degree of, of self-doubt and, and self-scrutiny. I, I also think that, you know, it is important to engage in, in the contemporary political debates. I think that, you know, increasingly we uh, have let our wars go on autopilot. And I also think that because there's such a small number of contemporary veterans, I think that the, the image of the veteran that a lot of people have is, has more to do with kind of pop culture archetypes. Um, usually oscillating between sort of like heroes and sort of traumatized victims, right? Um, and, uh, or, or, you know, you have a, a, an interesting anecdote in the book uh, about um, uh, when you were applying to grad schools being questioned about, you know, something that the, a journalist had, had quoted you saying, uh, where it seemed like she had a, had a, had fear that you might like come on campus and start shooting people. Um, so, and I've, I've encountered similar type things. Um, and so I, I do feel that there's an obligation to, to address, you know, a lot of the cultural garbage that you'll see. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also to try and talk very seriously about, about military policy, about returning veterans. Uh, I've written a decent amount about trauma and the kind of complexities of it. Um, and and also about the sort of what I see as the pact between the the soldier and the society that sends him out and 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 the sort of importance of of citizenship I think Jim Wright has um, has been a uh, you know f phenomenal played a phenomenal role in the public discourse um, you know in, I agree. in the United States on that point and, and we're really fortunate um, that uh you know that he he did a lot of that with with dartmouth as a platform um have you well i guess you're not back on campus now um but have you had the opportunity to engage but you know back at back at dartmouth over the i have yeah yeah and and, I, I, and and actually um so i've come come back a couple times i've, I've spoken to you know english department <laughs> i've i've mm -hmm. uh, i've also come um uh, to speak to students through the Dickey Center and, and the government department, um, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Ben Valentino um, and others, uh, and have actually met with, with Jim Wright and also some of the veteran students on campus um, uh, who, you know, he was instrumental in trying to sort of bring veterans to Dartmouth, which has been, I think, um, you know, both certainly great for the, the, the folks who come, but also I think um, uh, really great for the school. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the, the kind of dinner party conversations about, about the war and about service are, are, are getting real for me in a, in a, in a different dimension now, because my kids are 10 and eight, and, yeah. uh, and my older daughter um, said to me recently, she said, hey, dad, there's a, there's a book on the shelf with your name on it. Um, <laughs> it was like the first time that I confronted like the horror of the realization that my children are going to read this and I'm going to have to explain this now to them. 
Oh yeah. Um, and I, I know, I think you have a, uh, you have a, a new son this year. If I'm, if I'm not I, I, I have a third son. Yeah. A third son. New th yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so how do you, how do you think about sharing this experience with them someday? I mean, that's in a lot of ways, like the, the most, it's where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I met a, um, I met a soldier who, um, uh, is a friend of a friend and we were all getting drinks and he had been injured, uh, fairly seriously such that there was actually like, there's a photo of him where there's, you know, a daylight through his body. Mm. <clears throat> um, just like a total soldier thing to do. Like, um, <laughs> You know, like right, right at the moment of being horribly injured, like, if, dude, take a picture. If this doesn't uh, kill me, I'm really going to want to have this picture someday. Yeah, that's right. Like, um, but his daughter found it, right? And it gave her nightmares. Um, and and they didn't at first they didn't at first know that she'd like found it on his phone, um, which is is maybe a a reminder to scrub your phone <laughs> um but um and he was and he just said like yeah like i realized like oh like i'm gonna have the sex talk and the iraq talk those are like the talks that i need to have as a father to all my kids um makes the sex talk sound pretty easy which is nice. yeah yeah it does <laughs> um and it is something that i've thought about right like you know would would i want my my mm -hmm one of my sons to join the military, right? What would I tell them if, if they did? Um, I certainly, I certainly would want them to serve their country in some way, right? And if they did want to join the military, though I'd never push them into it, I would be proud of them. I would have a long conversation with them because I think that, you know, there's a, or there should be, I think, a moral contract between the society that sends a soldier or Marine over to war um, and that soldier. And the, and the, the, the soldier or Marine is, um, is saying, look, I'm, I, I'm gonna go into a situation that, that might be really morally bruising. I'm gonna put my body on the line, sometimes possibly my mind. Um, and in return, what the society owes that, that, that service member is a moral and coherent mission mm -hmm. that is achievable. Um, and I don't think that we have been living up to that side of the bargain. Um, and so what do you do? I, I know a, I was at an event, it was a documentary um god this is like a not long after the rise of isis right and in the q a this marine stands up you know kind of muscular tough looking guy must have been like the perfect image of a marine in dress blues and he says you know i was a marine sergeant in iraq combat veteran you know and if you'd ask me a couple of years ago who i was what i was i would have told you Marine, sergeant, led Marines in combat, right? That's what I was. This is what I was proud of, what I was. And says, but now I'm looking at what's happening in Iraq and what's happening to the people there. And I'm starting to wonder, was I part of an evil thing? Because if I was part of an evil thing, I don't know who I am anymore, mm -hmm. right? And, and look, I don't think... Um, and I don't think that that former sergeant needs to feel ashamed. I think um, I don't think it is up to the 19-year-old kid who signs up to join the military to, while he's doing everything he can to prepare physically and mentally for one of the most harrowing experiences that a human being can endure, that he's also ensuring that our foreign policy and military policy makes sense, right? That's not his job or it's not his job alone, right? That's yeah. all of ours. Um, but God, I get where he's coming from. How could you not get where he's coming from? Yeah. And so 
um, <laughs> want part of the conversation about joining the military, and especially because you know the military makes such a difference, not just whether your country's policy makes sense, but whether you got good leaders, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at uh, something like Greg Jeffy's phenomenal piece in the Washington mm -hmm. Post about the guys in Clint Lawrence's platoon, yeah. Lawrence is, is um, uh, the sort of war criminal who's sentenced and, and to prison for for um, uh, for murder in Iraq. Um, who clearly sort of came into this unit. Uh, he was there for like three days uh, before mm -hmm. uh, uh, the incident, just wanting to kill somebody. Um, and this entire platoon of, of, you know, combat vets immediately turned him in, right? And then the narrative somehow became that he was a hero, right? And he, and sort of kind of uh, a particular and ugly corner of, of, of uh, the right wing media ecosphere and uh, President Trump pardoned him, right? And so you have these guys who are living in the aftermath, the fact that, you, you know, their unit was uh, murdered people murdered innocent people, right? Um, and, and they were failed at every level, right? And there's this sort of phenomenal piece in the post by Jaffe about their lives afterwards, about the officers that they came upon who assumed that they were the ones who had done something wrong by turning in their lieutenant, um, uh, you know, and then up to the commander in chief. And so part of that conversation would be about, you know, uh, you know, what happens when you, when you put your shoulder to the wheel of an organization that's bigger than you and you don't control? Now, I think that's important. I think that's important to do because the only way, the only way that we make progress as a country, as a civilization, as, um, uh, is by joining together, by building up institutions and, and trying to sort of push them forward um, and putting our heart and soul into them. But any institution is going to be riven with problems, right? And can go awry. And that's not always going to be up to the individual. And so what do you do? What do you do when the institutions that you've, you've given yourself to let you down? And I think that that is something that can happen in literally any walk of life, but I think it's particularly painful when it's something like, like the military because in of the stakes. And particularly easy in a, in a yeah. society where there's this, this gulf between the reality and the mythology of it, right? Where right. You know, we, we, we collectively lionize the, you know, the square-jawed tough guy. Um, but my experience, at least, was, wasn't that the square-jawed tough guy was, was, was always the, the best. Um, right. You know, and, and actually, I think when, when the... Uh, when, you know, the, the chips are down, um, the, the leaders of, of, at every level who, who I always felt most confident in, um, the trait that they shared in common was, was calmness, the, the ability yeah. to make good decisions um, as the world was kind of evaporating around them. And, um, you know, and, and it was, they, they were water on the fire, not, not gasoline on the fire. Right. And, and yes. Lawrence and, and others like him. And unfortunately they're, they're, you know, more than one now that we can talk about in public discourse um, were, you know, they were, they were sound to me like gasoline on the fire leaders. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I think we, we've confused toughness with cruelty. Right. And they're not at all the yeah. same thing. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so um Let's talk for a minute, Phil. I'm, I'm curious about the the path to to writing uh, from the military. I uh, um, I saw you mention uh, Tom Slay somewhere yeah. in your yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you know Tom? I did. Um, oh, he's an know? amazing, yeah. amazing human being. <laughs> yeah. So another another point of intersection at Dartmouth, um, and uh, and and you also mentioned uh, Grace Paley. Um, yeah. Another, you know, I think, I think she lived right, right near Hanover. Um, she was a Montgomery there. fellow when I, uh, my senior year, I believe, she was a Montgomery fan, fellow and uh, the creative writing wow. students, we got to have lunch with her, right? And she did readings as well that we went to. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I remember hearing her say that um, uh, when she, she said, when I revise, I never revise to make the story better, I revise to make it more true. Uh. And I always, I always think of that, um, yeah. you know, that this, you know, fiction is a, is a truth seeking enterprise, right? It's not, 
uh, not just about kind of crafting pretty sentences. Um, yes, Tom. So Tom was a, uh, so he's a poet and, and an essayist, actually a journalist. Um, and I had not met him before, but he was my advisor for my senior thesis. And I remember sort of the first time that I sat down to meet him, he literally just went through like, okay, so what books have you read? And he just went through the entire canon of like uh, great books of all history, right? Just to, to feel out my knowledge. It was one of the <laughs> more intense literary discussions I've ever had um, as he was just trying to get, get his moorings. Uh, and, you know, he just dropped little kind of brilliant lines about various of the books as we were going through. Um, and then once he had that, he was like, okay, so you're going into the military, so you're going to need to read some of the greatest minds who have ever written about war. And so he had me read War and Peace and Isaac Bab Babel's Red Cavalry. He had me read Selene, Turning to the End of the Night. He had me read David Jones um, and other of the trench poets. Uh, he had me read Robert Graves and, and Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he had me read like uh, <laughs> all of Hemingway's short stories and one other book over like the course of a weekend. And by the end of that weekend, I was writing emails and like semi Hemingway, -esque, you know, sentences. like, yeah, <laughs> like prose, you know, like faux. <laughs> it had just gotten into my head. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was tremendous experience working with him. And he stayed in touch uh, throughout. I remember calling him, you know, talking to him when I was in, in, uh, in the basic school. And then Tom later went over and started doing journalism in conflict zones. Um, and kind of one of the kind of really cool things for me as a writer is having somebody that I've, whose work I've looked up to and admired who had been going on a journey trying to think through from a you know, very different angle, a lot of the same questions that I was wrestling with in my work. And so uh, uh, some of the ideas that he had come to about how to write about fiction, uh, sorry, how to, not, uh, not how to write fiction as a poet, but how to write about um, war and conflict and, and you know, uh, and homecoming were really powerful me, for me, especially because, you know, he's not a, um, he's not a fan of a particular kind of like, I went there and I saw and I am, you know, uh, uh, experience the suffering and, and mm -hmm. he has no interest in that. Um, uh, he writes about, uh, you know, he talked about sort of the, the difference between being in a place where you're seeing people physically going through horrific things and everything feels very immediate and concrete, right? And then coming back to the States and being in what he terms a, a hell of opinions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just wanting the sort of the real physical concrete incarnational detail. And, and I think that's one of the things that drives him as a, as a writer, but yeah, I've stayed in contact with him. Uh, I just emailed him um, the other day uh, and he's going to do a, <laughs> he's going to be, I'm going to be in conversation with him for uh, one of the events for my book launch. Uh, and I uh, couldn't be more delighted, but yeah, you know, it's one of those things like you meet people who, you don't know are going to be tremendous and important lifelong influences, but you know, so it wasn't just that he was a tremendous, you know, thesis advisor, you know, pushing me on how to write fiction and how to think about it and pushing me to read a lot of really great stuff and, and, and think about it in a really rigorous way. Um, uh, but that he's continued to influence me going on. Uh, other uh, Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth folk who, who had uh, sort of formative influence for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, Roberta Stewart, a uh, wonderful classics professor who's done a lot of yeah. work on the intersection of, of, you know, of, of classical thought and, and military service and, and kind of public life and international I've, affairs. And I, I, think I visited know. her class, actually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, she's been doing uh, these amazing uh, courses on, um, uh, <laughs> on war literature. And I'll be actually meeting with virtually with one of her, her classes later on uh, I think next month. But also, you know, I remember, I think one of the first times I went to her class, there was a vet who had read the first story in my book. And, and then he looked up my, and he 
and he had liked it, but then he looked up my bio and he saw that I hadn't been an infantry officer. And he was like, who the hell is this guy, right? This poser. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he, so the rest of the book he realized, it was like, oh, it's not, they're all different. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. So fun. yeah, I had a, uh, it was really fun because I had this, uh, in the class, uh, we had a long discussion about that and his, his relationship to it. Because <laughs> in the middle of the class, he goes, okay, I'm saying nice things to you now, but I'm going to be honest. Last week when I came in here, <laughs> just tell your story, right. I was throwing shots at you. <laughs> You know what? One of one of the funny things um, you're you're in the you're in the front of the classroom now. You're you're you know you're sitting in the house by Occam Pond, and uh, it, it's kind of scary to realize that that uh, you know going through school or, or or when I was younger, I used to think about they right they who 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 make the decisions, make the rules, mm-hmm. set the policies, and you know they are just us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's and terrifying. It's, it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> there is no they, um, and I, th- I think you realize that. You know, you get older, you see like your knucklehead lieutenant buddies become colonels and generals, and 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 you know your Dartmouth classmates end up doing all sorts of interesting things in businesses and government and other places, and you realize that that they are are really just us. Uh, <laughs> and I wish I'd known that a lot earlier. <laughs> well, I don't know. It gave me a certain amount of comfort. <laughs> Thinking that there was a hand on the tiller someplace. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And it's, right. and it's yeah. just, if, if they're steering this thing about as well as I could, we're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, well, one of, one of the things I love about these, I do love about these Zoom conversations is, is we get a glimpse into people's spaces. And, and I, I, I love the, the books on the shelf behind you. And one thing I, you know, this is not a planned question, but I can't help but notice, but maybe that's a galley of missionaries on the shelf behind you. Or early <laughs> oh, con- you noticed. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's um, funny how it ended up there. It's so weird. It's, 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 I, would, <laughs> yeah. I am eager to hear more about this. Sure. Uh, so I spent six years writing this. Um, uh, had to learn enough broken Spanish to be able to uh, interview people with, with the aid of my wife and, and sometimes my wife's family. Uh, they, uh, my wife's family is mostly from Medellin in Colombia. Uh, book place takes in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Colombia, uh, and Yemen in America. And it is about the way in which, it's sort of about the globalization of violence, I suppose, would be the best way to describe it. The ways in which, you know, if redeployment was about the individual's experience in Iraq, um, it's, this is more about the ways in which our wars blend in, bleed into one another. Um, so if you picture a Colombian special operations unit preparing for a raid in you know, a poor area of Northern Colombia, Northeastern Colombia, imagine them watching their target using a drone, an American drone, they're using tactics that were taught to them by U.S. soldiers. Those tactics were developed and honed to perfection in Iraq um, uh, by special forces guys and operators who operated in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you see a, uh, and so there's there's a raid very much like that in 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 my book based on. Uh, <laughs> a real thing that happened where the Colombian military got intelligence about a drug lord had special ordered a six foot tall teddy bear for his girlfriend. And they realized that they could follow the teddy bear um, uh, to then go and get him. Um, and that particular raid uh, sets off a chain of events that bring four people's lives together. One is a American journalist named Lissette. Uh, who starts out in Afghanistan and just basically burns out being being tired of reporting on a war that the American public seems to have lost interest in and is is looking for a good war, right? One that we are winning. Uh, uh, and she's told that Colombia is that place. Um, one is a American special forces guy who has become disillusioned with the way that special forces has increasingly been used just for direct action for violence uh, rather than the kind of old mission of warrior diplomat that the culture is changing, uh, particularly uh, as I trace him through one very violent deployment in Afghanistan based on a real deployment in 2007. Um, And he ends up being the special forces liaison at the American embassy in in Bogota. 
uh, a Colombian uh, special uh, special operations uh, officer uh, who works with that American and a poor guy, a kid from a poor region in rural Norte de Santander, which is a department in Colombia, uh, on the border uh, where you know his region sort of trades hands between guerrilla and paramilitaries and and uh, drug lords, um, and it's about sort of what happens there, sort of wraps all these characters together uh, and then sort of uh, their consequences uh, far outside of that particular region. Uh, so that's that's the the idea behind the book, right? Uh, and it's just, it, as I said, it's something that I've been working on for six years. Um, I've always been interested, actually I studied with uh, uh, Tanalis Padija, uh, Tanalis Padija, I, I studied Latin American insurgency movements at, at Dartmouth. Um, and the Colombian conflict, conflict is fascinating. Colombia's been the largest recipient of military aid uh, in the Western Hemisphere since the end of the Clinton administration. We keep sending ambassadors to Colombia to be ambassador to Afghanistan or uh, Pakistan because the missions are actually surprisingly similar. Uh, and so it seemed like the perfect way for me to talk about this sort of new style of war that America's engaged in. Um, and to show it in, in sort of very personal ways through actors involved at different layers of the process. Wow. I'm, I can't wait to read it. Um, I, I, I gotta ask, I mean, 10 years in, 20 years in, depending on how we count, um, what do you feel like we've learned from this, if anything? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what have you learned, but, but also what have we collectively learned? Well, so uh, partly, so there's what we've learned intellectually, but then there's what we've put into, into institutional practice. And the sad thing is those are often very different. So I think, you know, as I mentioned before, I think one of the things that we've, we have learned intellectually is the limits of military power to, cr to create sort of stability in, in overseas, right? The limits of force, brute force as a mechanism for achieving uh, political outcomes that we want, right? And we've actually gotten very, very sophisticated um, in terms of our understanding of the interaction between different types of foreign aid and suppression, right? Military force and, you know, the combinations of the two that can be most effective in reducing violence and what happens when we kill a civilian, how that relates to increased violence or animosity from the population and what happens when our enemies kill a civilian. Um, you know, there are just reams and reams of data uh, about the wars that could actually be very useful, right? Um, we've also created a highly sophisticated machine for kill capture missions, right? So if you think of, say, uh, in 2004, Joint Special Operations Command was conducting about 12 raids a month in Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. By 2006, they're doing about 250, right? Now, that's not because, like, the Navy SEALs went to the gym and got, like, a little bit more buff and more worthy of writing memoirs. Um, it was because uh, the sort of whole system by which we... Uh, you know, fine, fix, you know, the, the whole, the, the, yeah. the crystal kind of. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the whole system of targeting, mm -hmm. right, became much more sophisticated. Um, it's not necessarily about a single unit it, or even a technology. It's more about the ways in which you take different types of units, different types of intelligence sources, different types of organizations and bring them together to create as rapid a turnaround on using actionable intelligence as, as, as is humanly possible, right? And that system is extremely lethal. Now, in American pop culture, normally when we talk about like Navy SEALs doing a raid, most people think it's really cool. When we talk about drones killing somebody, most people think it's just something a little creepy about that. But from the perspective of the targeting system, that's just the Phillips head and the flathead screwdriver at the end of the system, right? That system is on industrial scale. It's very, very um, yeah. effective. We can apply that system to other countries. We've offered that system. We help Colombia kill a lot of leaders, right, starting in the mid 2000s. Uh, the only difference is that, you know, the last part of that, the Colombians did with smart bombs that we gave them, right? Uh, and so if, and at the same time, we have gutted uh, the State Department, USAID, the sort of tools that we have of, of non-lethal force. So we've learned that 
there are limits to what we can do. We've learned that we need, you know, if we want to achieve the political outcomes that we say we want when we go into a country with military force, we need to be involving USAID and the State Department. We need to be uh, creating a more robust plan for the aftermath in which various different tools of American power are going to be used to create more stable settlements. In theory, we know that. We've learned that lesson over and over and over again. If you watch the things that our secretaries of defense have said when they've stated that quite flatly. Our generals, when we've, when you, when you, we, you know, would listen to General Vodal talk about like the, what the plan for like after ISIS is going to be and only two of the functions that are critical are going to be DOD functions and all the other functions that are critical are going to be other organs of government. We know that that is necessary, but Institutionally, in terms of what we have funded, what we have political will to put into effect, the only thing that we seem to like is killing people. It's kind of a staggering um, bottom line, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it feels like an end. In conflicts that don't end, it feels very satisfying to bring something to a close, right? And this is a bipartisan thing, right? I'll, I'll never forget Obama's State of the Union address where he said that if you doubted his, you know, res resolve against fighting terrorism, ask Osama bin Laden, you know, ask the head of the Benghazi thing, as if, you know, killing a couple guys or was the same as a policy, right? But it sounds like a response. Right. Yeah. How about, how about you personally? What have you learned? <laughs> Uh, what? Can't get off the hook talking policy. So. <laughs> I, I have learned that your idealism needs to be tempered with just enough cynicism, but not enough cynicism that it gives you a pass for not trying to make things better. How about yourself? Nicely said. Uh, I have learned to hold my convictions less tightly, perhaps in a lot of ways. Um, um, I have a lot less certainty in my worldview uh, than yeah. I feel like I used to. Um, Same a lot more kind of openness to the validity of all different perspectives and, and oppose the, the, the notion that completely opposing points of view can, can both be right and can coexist. Um, and, I've, and, and, you know, maybe a desire to shrink, shrink my world a little bit, um, focus more on the things that, that I can, uh, you know, I can actually um, influence, you know, under kind of in my own my own little little sphere. Well, then uh, uh, maybe it's maybe it's not that bad that there's no they that it's it's not us. That's that sounds like <laughs> that same sounds like a good good attitude for going forward. But uh, um, listen, it's it's been a it's been a real treat having a conversation with you. Same. And, yeah, um, it's been wonderful. You know, I, 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 uh, I just love as a, as a, you know, a citizen and a, and a fellow alum and a, and a fellow vet, I love that you're out there in the, you know, in the public discourse um, and uh, having, having a, a huge impact on, on how we collectively um, think about the world and, and what we can and can't do in it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. <laughs>